Friends, this is Roy Turner. Roy lives in Tupelo, and tell us who you are, Roy. Well, what you do. For some reason or another, I wound up being the local Elvis historian as far as his childhood goes. Okay. I was always interested in local history, so it kind of sprang from that. But you do, you have really dug into his early history that there's not a lot known about. Since 1981, uh, in 1981, a lady came here from London, England to write a book about Elvis. Uh, it became the, the biography Elvis and Gladys. Her name was Elaine Dundee. Uh, she was probably the first author of, uh, uh, how do I want to say this, a very well-respected author, okay. uh, serious author, that had ever written about him. And, and she took a serious look. Uh, when the book came out, the Boston Globe said it was uh, the best Elvis biography that had ever been written. And it actually was a springboard to... Uh, Peter Grounick came after her, and before he came to Tupelo, the first thing he did was call her and say, can you give me some advice? And she said, well, call Roy. He'll help right. you. And uh, since then, I've... So you helped Peter with his book, too. Uh, very little. Not and, to the extent I did his, a lane. his book is one of the ones that everybody feels like is the most... Last Train to Memphis. Last Train is yes. the most accurate of yeah. all of them. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, Elaine was here for five months, and that's when... I began researching Elvis. I'd never thought about it before. Uh, I was a big Marilyn Monroe fan. Okay. And I, I mean, I went to the same school Elvis went to. He even came to school one day when I was there. I did not get to see him. Uh, I always heard about what he was in town. You know, just grew up with Elvis stories. I saw all of his movies, liked some of his songs, but I wasn't, I guess, a, an Elvis fan, per right. se. My wife and I did get to go see him in 74, I think it was, at the Mid-South Coliseum, had front row center stage seats. Wow. Uh, that whole front row was cousins of mine because my cousin's moonlight job was working the box office. Oh, okay. <laughs> Two of my cousins got scars. So he pulled some strings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, Elaine came, and we started researching, and, and she was here for five months, and she went back to London, and it took her four years to write the book. Wow. And I continued to find people and interview them, and we'd talk once a week, sometimes twice a week, on her dime, because I couldn't afford to call London mm -hmm. in that day and age. Uh, so she invested quite a bit in this book, time-wise. Oh, yeah. Her publisher gave her an $80,000 advance. Uh, to come. In fact, her publisher came to her. She had written a biography on Peter Finch that was very successful. Prior to that, she was a novelist. Her first novel came out in print in 1958. It has never been out of print. It's considered a modern classic. It's called The Dud Avocado. Uh, she was married to Kenneth Tynan, who's the, not at that time, they had divorced by then, but uh, had been married to Kenneth Tynan, the theater critic, mm -hmm. uh, first for the London Observer and later for, I think it was um, the New Yorker, uh, one of those New York publications. Mm -hmm. He was like a really well-respected critic. He was like the guy. Uh, the 10 years of the 50s, up, I think they may be married in uh, 50 or 51, divorced about 64. That period, uh, they were the couple, if you were in the theater world, they were the couple you wanted at their parties and you wanted to be at their parties. Their best friends were... Uh, for a while were Lawrence Olivier and Vivian Lee wow. until Ken wrote a scathing review on a play Vivian was in and then Larry pitched fit and they didn't get along so they never, right never could, got to go back. They would go to the bullfights with uh, Ernest Hemingway and Orson Welles and wow. uh, I never can say that word, Pampelona, Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Elaine was at one time engaged to Orson Welles. Wow. She had come from a very wealthy New York family her grandfather was an inventor, a contemporary of uh, Edison, and he invented a, a screw called the Parker Kalun self-tapping screw. And it was the first screw that didn't require a bolt, and it was first used to build the Spirit of St. Louis. Hmm. And because of the weight reduction, mm -hmm. he was able to take on the fuel to make that transatlantic That's fly. Right. When and they, that was a big deal on the yes. airplane, how it was assembled, yeah. And when they refurbished the uh, Statue of Liberty, they put it back together with Parker K. Lund self-tapping screws. Wow. 
Her grandfather and father were both millionaires that lost everything in the crash of 29, only to become millionaires again. Uh, her father was the, uh, gave the initial money to build the Albert Einstein Medical Center in New York. So they were pretty philanthropic. Uh, so anyway, long story short, uh, she came to Tupelo to write this book, and we didn't know her from Adam. Mm -hmm. But uh, she asked the library if there was somebody that could help her, and I was very involved in the local historical and genealogical society, and they suggested me, and that's how our friendship began. So long story short, it took her four years to write the book, so when it came out, she dedicated it to me and said, uh, you know, you've put as much into it as I have, it's as much your book as mine. And she actually gave me a, a little part of her royalties, but it, it was never much money, but I was, it was never about the money. <clears throat> so when our third daughter was born, we named her Catherine Elaine. Uh, I just kind of wanted to honor her, and yeah. then she wanted to be Katie's godmother. And she told me at the end of that summer, uh, I said, you know, this is the most exciting summer of my life. I was 29. She was 60, by the way. And uh, I said, this is the most exciting summer of my life, and I'm sorry to see you go. I know I'll never see you again because I'd always been starstruck. I said, I know I'll never see you again. She said, oh, no, we're going to work together again. And I thought, yeah, you're blowing smoke up my butt too. Mm -hmm. But we did, and we maintained a 27-year friendship until her death in uh, 2008 and at that point uh, I was executor of her state and she had told me in 2001 she said you know I'm starting to get old and when I die I want to set up a foundation in Tupelo to expose the little Elvises to the arts these were her words so upon her death uh, we took six hundred thousand dollars and we set up the Elaine Dundee and Roy Turner endowment for the arts and it's uh, handle through a entity here called create all they do is handle nonprofits monies and it's allowed me uh, a poor guy to be a, a philanthropist and I get to give away about 28 to 32 thousand dollars every year to various things to expose kids to the arts uh, and also to promote Elvis uh, we support the Elvis Festival, the Elvis Fan Club, the Elvis Birthplace, the Tupelo Community Theater, Tupelo Ballet, Civic Ballet, the uh, Gumtree Art Museum. Uh, we brought artists in from other areas to work with the kids in schools, anything from songwriters to painters to spoken word poets to African dancers, all because she came to Tupelo to write a book about Elvis. Wow. So Elvis in a way he just keeps on giving. He does keep on giving. <laughs> he does and that's her by the way. Okay. Uh, that was probably about 1963 or 4. That was uh, shot by Richard Avedon. Do you know who he was? Richard Avedon was uh, a very famous photographer in his day. He shot everybody who was everybody. Very cool. And the other picture is a, a drawing of her when she was a little girl. And you got these, I'm assuming, through the estate. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, that's very cool. And so she didn't have any children? She has a daughter my age. Okay. And this is uh, myself and her on top of the Chateau Montmont in L.A. She lived there for oh, wow. uh, a year or two after she moved to L.A. from London. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's her in those. Uh, this is the last time I ever saw her here, but there's a better picture of that. That's her with her friend Rosemary Harris, who was a, a big theater actress. In fact, Rosemary played Aunt May in the first three um, Spider-Man movies. Oh, wow. So she was very well known. Oh, very well. Very well known. Interesting. Uh, I would go out there every year for her birthday party because it coincided with... Uh, not because it coincided, I was going actually for a birthday party. It just happened to coincide with the death of Marilyn Monroe. Mm. And all the Maryland fans gather in L.A. around August 5th, the way the Elvis fans do here. Now, where do they gather? Uh, well, Not we, where Maryland's buried between those buildings. We, we actually would have a memorial service in the chapel where her 
funeral okay. was every year. That's where those big buildings are. It's kind of uh -huh. in the back. Yeah. Okay, I was there recently. Uh, you know, the little chapel in the yeah. cemetery. Mm -hmm. We would have our memorial okay. service in there. And uh, But most of us stayed at the uh, Orchid, which is a little uh, hotel. You know where the um, Kodak Theater is? I don't think they call it Kodak anymore. I don't know if it's Nokia or what. Mm -hmm. You know where the big elephants mm -hmm. are and everything? Mm -hmm. It's on a little... Uh, Dead end street behind that, the orchid. It's one of the best kept secrets there. <laughs> and uh, we just we would fill the whole hotel. Okay. So it worked out well. In fact, that's that's Marilyn Standin. Marilyn Monroe Standin. Yeah, and I can tell you some tales on her. <laughs> I took a big cussing from her. Really? But we were still friends. This is my friend Susie Kennedy, who lives in London and makes a living. Doing As that one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Looks like that's it. Susie with my wife. And at one time, Susie was engaged to this Elvis, and she brought him to Tupelo to see where Elvis was born. Unfortunately, they broke up. Mm -hmm. We thought, damn, they'll have some good. Yeah, looking, Elvis and, and they'll have some good-looking kids. Yeah. yeah, that's me and Susie, and so on. Oh, and me and Elaine. Yeah. But. Uh, very cool. She she really made life interesting. Uh, anyway, we'd always she'd always do this birthday party every year for herself. <coughs> and like the last birthday party that she had before she died, uh, Gloria Swanson. Uh, Gloria Swanson. She's dead. Gloria Vanderbilt came okay. to it. Wow. And I got to chat with Gloria Vanderbilt. Now that's um. Uh, That's Anderson Cooper's mothers. mother. Right, Anderson Cooper. I couldn't think of his mm -hmm. name. But, but uh, you know, Gloria had her own claims to fame. Mm -hmm. uh, the Gloria Vanderbilt jeans. She's also an artist, done a lot of stuff. Uh, I'm a Vanderbilt thing. fan. You know, I love uh, the Biltmore House. Yeah. And I've done a lot of the history of that kind well, of stuff. Well, uh, our little short conversation, uh, when I told her that I was Elaine's friend Roy from uh, Mississippi, her friends knew who I was and how I fit into her life. That was about all. Uh, our conversation went, oh really, my late husband was from Laurel, Mississippi. I remember going down there to the family reunions and that good fried chicken and we talked about Southern cooking the whole time we chatted. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Uh, so anyway, that's what got me into Elvis. So after Elaine's book, uh, like I say, Peter called, and then uh, Pat Brusky, who did Down at the End of Lonely Street with, I think, Peter Harry Brown, called. And then we started doing do documentary filmmakers, started calling, all coming, doing their little documentaries. And over the course of time, I just started soaking up stories and information, and, and then I got to filming some, excuse me, some interviews myself. And eventually made a documentary that uh, later got so sold to um, Biographies A and E A and E's really? Biography it Channel. It's Elvis Returned to Tupelo. Hmm. Now the way it worked, mine and my friend's uh, documentary was called Homecoming. Tupelo welcomes Elvis home. And I've got a poster from it out there in the hall. So this guy that I had met who was passing through. Uh, because I volunteered for the Tupelo Film Commission, I was telling him about doing it. He said, when you get it finished, uh, send it to me, and I'll see what we can do with it. So, long story, he shopped it around, and when A&E bought it, which, by the way, I didn't get any money for. That's another mm -hmm. story. <laughs> but uh, my story got told, and by my story, I mean, they stuck to what the points I had made in our original documentary because there had been so many false things. Yeah, well, and, and in the Elvis world, there's so many and, uh, things that are not accurate. They wanted, we had shot this on the cusp of HD with like a, a Canon SD camera that we'd given $5,000 for. An HD camera at that time was probably like 30000 mm -hmm. They wanted it shot in HD. They also didn't like our lighting set up and that kind of offended me at first and then I watched them set up lighting, and I learned a lot and knew why they didn't like mine. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's just kind of grown like a snowball over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elaine once said, uh, "If it, once Elvis enters your life, he never leaves. 
because she planned to write Elvis and go on to other things, and she did. But Elvis came, kept coming back, and uh, he pretty well does. <laughs> it's it's funny how that happens, yeah. but you're absolutely accurate. So anyway, that's how I became this Elvis dude. That's me and Elaine the last time I saw her. Yeah, that's the picture you were talking about. Very cool. Uh, she'd been very ill, and she died about two months after that. Oh, that's a shame. But... Uh, and that's, that's been a little over 10 years ago. You uh, said yeah, it was May 1st, 2008, yeah. when she passed. We set the foundation up uh, on May the 1st, 2009. Amazing. Yeah.